Thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. My name is Karen Butter, and I'm president of the Friends of the Alameda Free Library. Welcome, and we are so glad you're joining us. We're excited to welcome a special Bay Area author playwright who has a current production at the Marin Theater. Lauren Gunderson is joining us at this final 2021 Friends at Home event. And we're delighted to welcome back Mary Ellen Hunt, who will serve as moderator and introduce Lauren. Before we get started, I want to review technical details. This is a live webinar. The audio for the audience is muted and the video is turned off. So you will only see the speaker and the moderator. Please use chat to introduce yourselves and to ask questions. And please be respectful in your comments. Before I turn it over to our moderator, I wanna talk briefly about the Friends of the Alameda Free Library. We're a nonprofit organization that raises funds and advocates for an outstanding public library in Alameda. The Friends at Home events provide an opportunity to connect with you and to share common experiences. A special thanks to our supporters for their ongoing donations so that we can continue to honor our commitments to the library and to support future Friends at Home events. We ask that you consider a donation to the Friends in any amount that is comfortable for you via our website at alamedafriends.com or use the direct link listed in the chat. Now, I'm very pleased to turn the program over to Mary Ellen Hunt, who will serve as moderator and introduce our guest. Mary Ellen is a former dancer, now educator and administrator who has written about dance, the arts and the cultural scene of the Bay Area for the San Francisco Chronicle, the San Jose Mercury News, the Contra Costa Times, KQED and Diablo Magazine. For those of you who have attended past events, Mary Ellen was the moderator for George Decay. Now I will turn it over to Mary Ellen who will have a discussion with our speaker and a reminder to use chat to ask questions or send your comments. Mary Ellen. Thank you so much, Karen. Welcome everyone. Um, and thank you for being here at the Friends at Home author webinar with Lauren Gunderson who is an amazing playwright, storyteller, and creative mind. I'd also like to just take a moment to thank the friends of the Alameda Free Library, especially Kelly Ground, David Briel, Karen Romer, Karen Manuel, and of course, Karen Butter for organizing this event. So this evening, it's my privilege to welcome Lauren Gunderson. She is the author of some 30 plays that take off um, as their jumping points, topics that range from women in science, to reimagine Jane Austen heroines, to J.M. Barry's beloved Wendy and Peter Pan. Um, a native of Atlanta, she is the recipient of the 2016 Lanford Wilson Award from the Dramatist Guild and the 2016 Otis Guernsey Award for Emerging Writer. And she was awarded the prestigious 2014 and 2018 Steinberg ATCA New Play Award for her plays I and You, um, which was also a, a Susan Smith Blackburn and John Gassner Award finalist. <laughs> and the Book of Will. Her delightful children's book, Dr. Wonderful and Her Dog Blast Off to the Moon, which is really fun, um, follows the adventures of Dr. Wonderful and her dog, Newton. And as if she weren't already busy enough, um, she has a recent premiere uh, from November uh, of the next installment in her Pemberley series, Georgiana and Kitty, Christmas at Pemberley, which was co-written with Margaret Malkin and debuted at the Marin Theater Company, where she's playwright in residence. Lauren is also <laughs> developing musicals with Ari Afsar, Dave Stewart, and Joss Stone, and Kate Kerrigan and Brie Loudermilk. Lauren, you are one busy person. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to welcome you and have the chance to sit down in conversation. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So excited to be in your company. <laughs> so I wanted to start out, uh, so much has been made of the fact that you have been the most produced playwright in America twice now. You're beating out Tennessee Williams and August Wilson and Neil Simon. Um, so in 2019-20, I looked and it seemed like you had 33 productions going on. You were definitely pro prolific. How many projects are you juggling at once? Like for, for instance now, how many are you working on at once? Well, the funny thing is, I mean, the wonder and glory of being a playwright is that you write a play and unlike a movie or a TV show, which is made generally once, unless you're West Side Story or something like that, <laughs> and which is still twice, it's not that much. 
I write a play and after it premieres and I'm very, very involved in the premieres, usually the first, second, sometimes the third production, but then anyone can do it. So I have productions right now, probably a dozen productions of our Christmas show, Miss Bennett, um, in all over North America and some INUs and some silent skies. And so it's, it's this fascinating thing that, um, I, I, what I love so much about that is I just, I make a thing and then it's reborn so many different times in so many different ways. And I'm often have nothing to do with them except for having obviously written it, but, but I, I'm not involved. And in that way, it takes on a life of its own and whatever community is doing it, um, which that's what I've always loved and found so accessible and urgent and, and immediate about theater. Um, so anyway, so all that is to say, I have lots of plays going on. Most of them I have nothing to do with except for just cheering from afar. Um, but there's a bunch of new projects, um, one of which you mentioned, which is Georgiana and Kitty now playing at Marin Theatre Company for another week or so, um, which is a third in our trilogy. Uh, so that one's been wonderful, is very much involved in that. And I just came back from New York where I was working on two new musicals as a book writer. Um, you know, running 10 blocks from rehearsal room <laughs> across Manhattan, which was a delightful stress. Um, and there's, you know, a, I have a reading tomorrow of a new play and there's, you know, just always, uh, always a lot going on. A lot of it is the pandemic catching up with us. Things we couldn't accomplish are now kind of all, all of a sudden on everyone's schedule, but um, it's, it's, I, luckily, I love what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so does that feel a little bit different now that we're sort of in, not out of the pandemic, but things are starting to come back? Is your schedule changing? Were you doing lots of things by Zoom before? Everything by Zoom. Yeah. And and luckily, some some of the stuff is still by Zoom, which I think is good. There's, uh, you know, theater. It's nothing like being in, in person. Of course, that's the whole point of live performing arts is to be there but we all have lives. And I think we have learned that there is a power in taking care of yourself and saying, I don't know if I need to go all the way there for that. Can you do it without me? Can I do it by phone or Zoom just to preserve your own sanity and stress and the life of your family? So I'm starting to find that balance, um, which which is good. <laughs> but but yes, a lot of things coming back. And um, you know, I think we're at an interesting time. Um, my husband is a virologist. And so I am very aware of um, all of the, what a pandemic and the phases and the turns of a pandemic mean. And kind of once we think we're safe, like maybe don't think that totally. <laughs> so certainly coming back from New York where I went to Broadway three times and saw a bunch of plays with a lot of people and feeling grateful for that experience, but also kind of a little wary of like, I hope everyone keeps getting vaccinated so we can keep doing this. <laughs> um, anyway, so yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and you know, still finding that balance between running the ten blocks or or just feeling like maybe we should uh, do this remotely. <laughs> <Just call in. laughs> yep. So I wanted to ask you. You write so frequently about people, often women, um, whose stories have been largely lost to history, although they may have been known in their times. Uh, I'm thinking of Emily de Chatelet, the astronomer of Henrietta Leavitt, um, names that I, I love hearing about. Mathematician Ada Byron Lovelace. Um, and also the avant-garde uh, artist Rudolf Bauer. I found that interesting as well. Um, you've also created some wonderful characters. I'm wondering what is it that draws you to someone's story that makes you kind of think, oh, that would be an interesting one to, to follow. Yeah, I mean, the real trick of theater and the kind of the like anthropologic center of what a play specifically is trying to do is to meet a person who wants something that's hard to get. And sometimes it is an abstract thing, love and whatever, <laughs> um, lots of abstract things in the human condition to pursue. Um, sometimes it's a very literal thing, like a crown or a marriage proposal or something, yeah. but all of them are hard. And we follow this person through the ups and downs, through their trials, through figuring out how to get this thing that they want. And um, through that, we see them test themselves and other people around them. Um, and they get to a point of character definition. And the, the way I think about a play is, can we figure out who this person is, not by what they say, but what they do? So I say all of that, that's kind of dramatic theory <laughs> in, in brief, but it's because I have to run that through my head when I think of, if I'm saying looking at a historical figure, 
does this historical figure have a moment that I can earn that really makes them prove who they are? And again, not with words, but with deeds. Um, and so I, I think, you know, Ada Lovelace has, has that arc. There's so much against her and she's trying to do something impossible at the time. There, there weren't very many mathematicians who were women, certainly who were young, pretty and rich. Um, and so there, there's, this, there's this struggle within her um, and without. She really has to prove herself. Um, but it's the same with all of the characters, whether you're making them up or finding them in history. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I really want to find a character that wants something really bad. So we've got a lot of passion, um, who's up against a lot, which is part of why I go to women in science so often and women in history and, and marginalized stories, because frankly, the stories are better because they've got more to prove. They've got more to risk. They've got more against them. If it's like a really breezy, you know, well-connected man, <laughs> that's quite not quite as fascinating because like, yeah, he's probably going to get it. He'll be fine. <laughs> but if it's a woman trying to prove herself at a time, um, it's, it's, it's more interesting. One second. Let me do with my. <laughs> I think that that's the uh, <laughs> the sign of our our uh, times on Zoom. As a parent, I definitely have a lot of sympathy for those juggling uh, a couple of different things all at once. So we'll just give Lauren another moment. Um, and while she's taking that moment, um, I'll just mention again, no worries. I'll just mention again that um, Lauren's play is at Marin Theater Company for another week. Uh, so if you have a chance to see it, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, thanks for talking about um, your, your characters. So uh, you mentioned your husband, and actually I did want to ask about that play. Um, you said, uh, you know, you're, you're interested in finding out, um, you know, what is the thing that's hard to get for a person. And so could you talk a little bit um, about this incredibly timely play that um, you've written about Nathan Wolf, The Catastrophist? Um, what is it that, that uh, I think I might know some answers to that, but what is it that's hard to get? Um, And also I'm wondering, um, is it hard to write about somebody who's so close to you and who could tell you if you're getting it wrong or? (laughs) Oh, so hard. It was such a hard thing. I have no idea why I agreed to do that. (laughs) Um, Well, the truth is, I mean, Nathan is my husband who is an amazing scientist. um, And of course I know him very well and he's an amazing man and a father and husband. And so in some ways it felt like what a, what a perfect character. and, and also, of course, writing it, finding how hard it is to, to put someone you love and know so well in, in the grind of a play, which it's not very fun to be the main character of a play, <laughs> any play, <laughs> because you are put to the test. That's the whole point. That's why we do it, is we put our characters through so much to learn who they are, as I mentioned before. You prove who you are by what you do. But to put your husband or your wife or your partner um, in that place is a whole different um, kind of thing. So it is. Um, it was. It, it was wonderful and meaningful. And uh, what also what we were doing was I kind of let myself think about not just that uh, um, the character, but the play itself. The 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 structure um, of the play, the form was t- trying to twist and and move and do something new. So it's not just the character, <laughs> which meant it was not just my husband. Um, so I was really, we, we, we found a way to do something, I think, um, quite unique, um, pretty simple. I mean, radically simple, but, but in its simplicity, I think pretty brave. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really incredibly proud of it, but yes, it was, it was quite hard. <laughs> <laughs> what were you hoping um, would be the takeaway? I mean, it's, it's uh, something that we're all in the middle of right now, and it's hard to see where the pandemic is turning next and what's happening with it. Um, what was uh, your hope that you wanted people to walk away with from the catastrophist? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was about the, I mean, it's all about humanity. It's all about, um, I mean, I think every time I think about it, I think something different about it. But at this moment, I'm, I'm interested in this idea of, of heroism and the, 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 um, the important people at a moment in time that we need and we cling to. And for so many of us in the last year or so has been scientists and people who saw this coming or who were able to react quickly and give us these vaccines and give us a strategy, the Fauci's of the world. But the truth is there are, we could, any one of us could be one of those, those people, you know, heroism isn't something kind of knighted um, by, by a deity, but it is what you make yourself. And, and so as I now looking back on 
the story that we kind of that emerged um, from Nathan's story. It's about kind of a normal person who was asking the right questions, who was a really who persevered, was really resilient, um, and didn't give up. And and that's kind of every hero, right? So anyway, it's just I'm I'm when I think of it now, I kind of think of trying to take those people who we think are just so powerful and so gifted and kind of bring them down to the level of everybody. And just, yeah, we're all going through heartbreak and, and trials and betrayals and fears and struggles. And, and, you know, part of why we go to the theater is to see, well, how did they get through those trials and struggles? What, what did, what did they do? Whether they is the fictionalized version of Nathan in my play or it's Hamlet or Antigone or, you know, Walter in A Raisin in the Sun. We, we go to these plays to see like, how did they make it? How did they survive if they did? Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> that's, that's part of it is, is resilience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so and I'm going to reference another piece that um, seems you know, very timely, uh, Natural Shocks. Mm -hmm. um, and so with Natural Shocks, you were tackling um, the issue of gun violence. Um, I read that you uh, had waived royalties for that piece so that communities across the country could put on readings um, during the week of um, April 20th, I think it was. It was the anniversary of Columbine. Um, and uh, some people have referred to that as a kind of a theater activism. Can you talk about um, what you feel the responsibility is of theater artists to kind of speak to these social issues to this moment? Um, or maybe perhaps become a bit of an engine for change um, in the discussion um, of, yeah. of these issues. Thank you so much for that question. That it's become so, it, it was always been important to me. I mean, the very first plays that I remember trying to put together as a young person in you know, middle school, it was trying to respond to, I'm from the South, so I'm from Georgia, trying to figure out what I realize now was me being a little white girl in a, in a place with a very complex history um, of, of race and trying to figure out how, what does that mean for me? How do I help? When do I not speak? How, how do I, how do I lift? How do I, you know, get out of the way? Um, and I turned to theater to try to figure that out to like, what are the stories that unify? Um, and I thought, well, that theater's a way to do it. So some of my very earliest plays are me trying poorly, <laughs> of course, but, but trying to, to figure those questions out. Um, and so I do think, I think a lot of, um, uh, Toni Morrison's quote about all great art is political is one of her quotes, which I think is fascinating because it makes a lot of people mad. We're like, well, Mozart's not great because it's political. And I'm like, the difference between Mozart being played for a thousand dollars a ticket at, you know, the, the Met versus Mozart being played in a refugee camp, <laughs> um, that is a different experience. And the political nature of how art shines a light on something, however it chooses to do that, whether it's a play or a piece of music or just contextually, there's such opportunity for absolute breathtaking um, uh, impact. Uh, and sometimes it's very simple. I mean, our Jane Austen Christmas plays, most would not be called political. And yet Jane Austen was, was political in her own proto-feminist way. I mean, writing stories that center lot, not just one woman, but lots of women, lots of different kinds of women, women who turn to each other, who men love. Our, our heroine, Dear Lizzie, is loved for exactly who she is. She does not change for Darcy. In fact, Darcy is the one who's like, yeah, right, I was a little bit rough, rough there. <laughs> so in all of our Christmas plays, part of, I think, their popularity lies in the fact that we center lots of women um, and we give them agency. We give them the chance to speak their mind and we give them the chance to be known and be brave and to stand up for themselves and to change and to be there for each other. So in some ways that is a very simple kind of, of, of social politics, but I think it's very important. And if I had those plays when I was growing up, instead of watching the 10th Christmas Carol, and I love a Christmas Carol, but not a lot of ladies. Sometimes you can squeeze a lady in as a ghost, but most of it's like, you know, capitalism run amok and, <laughs> and, and dudes, dudes grieving. So I fine, you know, gr great snow at the end. Everyone's happy. A little tiny Tim. We love it. But our play has mostly women. Um, and, uh, we insist on lots of diverse casting. And so to make sure that it, it looks like the community that it's in, um, anyway, so all of those things can be very political. Now, natural shocks is a different one. That is very, very stridently, um, political. Uh, you walk away thinking, why on earth is this country so obsessed with guns and doesn't seem to see or care about the domino effect of a gun in the house combined with mis rampant misogyny combined with domestic violence that is not 
tackled um, on and on and on. So I think my plays run run the range. And part of that is because I like plays that are very political and urgent and gritty. And I also love a Christmas feminist <laughs> sisterly rom-com. I want all of them in my life and I want all to fill the theater with as many ways to, to feel seen uh, and to enjoy this art form that, that I love so much. So I think a broad scope uh, is important, but every single thing I do, and I, I'll just end the answer to the question with um, quoting my colleague Ari Afsar, who is the music and lyricist of my, the new musical, We Won't Sleep, which is premiering at Signature Theater and outside of Washington, D.C. In, in Arlington this um, spring. And it's a very political uh, new musical, but what she always says is that art changes culture and culture changes policy. And so there is a link. If we can make um, musicals and plays and novels and music that that start to become what we know. And I mean, I think of um, uh, uh, Hannah Nicole Jones, six, a 1619 project. And suddenly that's a word that we all know and we all know what that means. And that's that's massive. Now, of course, that's not, that's a different kind of work of art, work of journalism, certainly artistic. Um, but there's stuff like that, that sometimes, sometimes you really do strike the nerve and to be anywhere near that when it starts to, to have that culture change, that's how we can do our own. Instead of, I'm not going to run for Congress, I'm not going to run for president, but I will write a lot of plays that hopefully trickle into the people who will, and maybe they'll retain some of it. Um, and that's how you build community too, which is one of the more powerful things on this planet. So, yeah, absolutely. And 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 you know, just to sort of follow up on that, I mean, it, it's maybe stating the obvious, but you're a very successful woman in a profession that's pretty male dominated um, historically. Um, and you've said um, uh, before in interviews that you write plays that really give women voice. You know, like as you were just saying, um, you know, put their struggles and passions and power and wit center stage. And I do appreciate that about, uh, you know, Jane Austen. I think that, you know, those are women who are in um, powers that are not positions of power um, and they are, are looking for, you know, ways to navigate through that system. So um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, um, do you feel like perhaps you are sort of coming to your success in the right, by being the right moment, uh, right playwright at the right moment and, you know, the person, the voice for this time? Um, or, you know, is there something else that you feel is sort of like touching, touching on what people, you know, connect with? I have no idea. I have no idea why I'm on that list. Um, I like to think that I write pretty good plays that um, I will say I know about myself only except for maybe one or two of my plays, all of the others end with a kind of, I've come to describe it as a hard hope. So it's not, it's not easy. It's not easy breezy, everyone cupcakes and unicorns running around, but it is, you do feel hopeful and it feels hard won, like you've, you've earned it and the characters have earned it. So there is, there's something to look forward to, some way to keep fighting. Um, and I think that that is a feeling that theater is really good at because there's this weird thing in the theater where the play's over, the lights come up and you're in this liminal moment. There's a few seconds there where you're in between fiction and your drive home <laughs> and, and the real world. And I think that's one of the most precious parts of theater is that space between the applause or, you know, you know what I mean? Like when the play goes down and the applause and when the lights go, you know, the play ends and the lights come up. And I think that is this magical moment where change actually happens because what of that play are you going to take with you? What's the first question you ask the person next to you? Wow. What did you think? And what's your answer? Oh, it made me think this, this, and this. Well, maybe that's very opposite of what the other person did. Now we're learning. Now we're talking. Why did you think that? Oh my gosh, I didn't. That's amazing. Tell me more conversation, conversation. And so there's something about that, that space that is really interesting. And I think that um, especially if the ending has that hard hope to it, there's something to talk about that, that includes like, what do I do? You know, <laughs> what, what can I be a part of? Um, and I, I, so I, I think that's part of perhaps some of my, um, uh, whatever it is, success or popular. I don't know. <laughs> it's very weird to talk about ones. I'm Southern. So I'm like, Oh no, not me, not me. I demure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but I do think that, um, a lot of my plays are very funny as well, which always people love, love to laugh. And I think strategically, 
laughter actually helps us lean in to a story and it also helps us know who's around us. So um, those mm's, ahs, the guffaws, the chuckles, uh, you know, primally we are tuned to go, oh, look at all these people who laughed at what I laughed at. Oh, now we're building a community. Now we know who's in the audience around us. Now we're thinking, oh, I'm a part of a thing that's bigger than myself. These are all great things, right? They make us feel in a different way. They make us, they make us um, absorb the story uh, in, I think, a more potent, potent way. So all of these strategies, I think, um, I don't know. I, I, I also just write what I want to see. <laughs> I think, you know, I've never seen a play that's really romantic or that's really brainy, but about women, but, but, you know, I'll just kind of reverse engineer something that I'm like, I wish that existed. Let's make that happen. And in the theater, you can do such crazy things. So <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And actually, I was going to ask you if, if there's something that you haven't done yet where you're like, you know what I would love to do is uh, this kind of play. Is there okay. anything on your list? Oh, totally. I had this idea the other day. I was like, what is the sexiest play? And it's like, this is like library brainy folks in the audience. So, so part, part in the divergence, but bra oh brainy, brainy, sexy play. I was like, what is the, just one that everyone's like, yeah, I want to see that. You know, I haven't written that one yet, partly because I'm a little prudish, but I will, um, I felt like, oh, that would be really great to do something that is, it's like so romantic mm -hmm. and not in a cheesy, you know, violins in the wings kind of a way, but where you're just like, I really want them to get together. <laughs> so I love that feeling. Um, and then there's a, a couple of other like sci-fi ones. Theater's not really great at sci-fi. And so that makes me want to prove us wrong that we can be. <laughs> There's a few AI ones that are really interesting. Um, so anyway, bo both, they're totally different directions, but those are, that would, what came to mind. <laughs> nice. I would love to see a sci-fi play. I think that would be really great. <laughs> also, my husband and I used to have uh, dreams of how to, how to keep that moment, the moment that you mentioned after the lights have come up, but before everybody makes it home, how do you keep that going? Um, you know, I know in New York, sometimes people go out to coffee and they sit and they just talk for a long time about what they've just seen. And, uh, you know, if there's any way to engineer that before people get into their cars, I think. Oh, and that, it's the best that like hour after a play, good or bad, because even sometimes you go to see a bad one and it's the most fun <laughs> conversation. <laughs> You just get to trash it. Sorry, no, all theater is great. <laughs> you can learn something from all of those experiences. Yeah. <laughs> so um, not to not to go down the route of like what's good or bad, um, you know, bad theater, but we're in, in the midst of this pandemic. Um, during lockdown, it felt like we saw out of necessity a lot of creativity actually around virtual theater, maybe some bad Zoom plays, um, but also some really unique opportunities so what's your feeling on virtual theater and the impact that that might have on like theater with a capital T going forward? Have you yeah. seen things from virtual theater that you think are worth keeping or developing? I mean, I think all more, the more theater, the better, whatever, however it, it happens. There are theater that happens on a cell phone, you know, th there's artists who will call you and there's a play that happens on, on the phone. Great. Okay. <laughs> wonderful whether it's on zoom i'm i'm all everyone's tired of zoom but but there is there are ways to make all of it um work and i think what's fascinating is um you know you have the really high end productions like your hamilton on disney plus or my favorite is the national theater and their incredible theater at home productions which you stream and are just gorgeous and I've watched almost all of them. So the Midsummer Night's Dream, oh, mwah, amazing. Amadeus, oh, oh gosh, I was just, just thriving in my bathtub watching, <laughs> watching a play. This is great. What this is wonderful. Yeah. So, and I do think that we now are starting to have some research that shows that, of course, it does not deter. It actually encourages theater attendance because you get used to seeing it. You start to, if you haven't really seen that much theater before, you can start to have a vocabulary, some shared references, and you feel more welcome when you do go. Um, so I think all of this stuff is great. And it reminds me, right before the pandemic, I was working with Audible, um, who created a theater company, Audible Theater Company. So the, the audiobooks company started commissioning, not just producing, but commissioning new plays. And I was in one of their first cohort to come to to write plays specifically designed to be heard, but also about half of them or a fourth of them, actually they produce off Broadway. So mine was one of the ones that they produced and seeing how many people came because they heard it and they said, oh, 
I want to see it now. Or, oh, I didn't know I could see it. And that made me want to see it. And the reverse of saying, okay, I really want to hear, I want to see the play. I want to hear the play again. I want to hear, and you can, you can just go to Audible. You, all of you can go right now (laughs) and listen to it. Um, It's called the Half-Life of Marie Curie. And so we had a lot of people that were able to have a conversation with us in New York off Broadway from Kansas and Canada and the UK and Australia and Brazil. And, you know, so all of that I think is nothing but good news for the theater and nothing is like a live performance, but we all kind of know that it's not actually competing. It's just more, uh, more indifferent, which I think is great news. Interesting. Reminds me a little bit of how uh, they used to do radio programs. Um, you know, it'd be Ronald Coleman and Random Harvest, but, you know, like the half hour version of it on radio. <laughs> exactly. And just like delightful, delightful. Absolutely. So um, in a moment, uh, we'll open it up to more questions from our audience. If you'd like to submit a question uh, for Lauren Gunderson, please do put it into the chat. I see some people have been sending us questions already. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, And while our audience is thinking about their questions, Lauren, I'd like to ask you um, one more thing. Um, Who are your heroes uh, in the world of theater? What are things that you've seen that inspire you? Mm, You know, it's funny. We were just talking about politics. So when you said heroes, the first thought was Stacey Abrams <laughs> from Georgia. So I could not be more proud and excited about all that. She, she makes did. it all the way up to governors. <laughs> but it's also like there's theater to what she does. You know what I mean? Um, in the world of theater, I think politicians, boy, we know we we know how much theater, good and bad, <laughs> um, there are. And so I, I appreciate somebody um like her uh, and, you know, several really, really great, great change makers uh, in this, this country that use what I know is theater. I'm like, I see you there. That was a good turn of phrase, good script, nice, nice enunciation. Well done. (laughs) Um, But specifically uh, in the theater, I mean, Lynn Nottage, uh, Sarah Rule, Paula Vogel are kind of my playwriting sources of inspiration and gratitude. Um, and, you know, I just I just went to uh, New York last week, as I mentioned, to work on these plays. And I, I managed to get tickets to a play called Trouble in Mind, which um, has become a really just in the last couple of days has has just blown my blown my idea of 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 theater. Um, and I'll just tell you a tiny bit about it. That playwright is Alice Childress um, and the play what premiered 60 years ago off Broadway. Um, and the story is about a company of largely black actors. Um, and they are in a play. And of course, all manner of micro and macro aggression is brought to light about the parts that they get to play and the ones they don't and this white director. It's just all of the things going on right now. And it was a play from 60 years ago. Wow. Um, and and of course it was supposed to go to Broadway, but the producer said, you have to, to tamp down all of that racism talk. And of course she didn't. And then six years later, here is this play on Broadway and it's an extraordinary production. So I think of that playwright and like, sometimes it takes half a lifetime for the product of your genius to be really seen. So I am, she, she has become a new hero, Alice Childress. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And thank you for the recommendation. I'll definitely keep that one in mind. So we have some questions. Um, would you uh, let us know if the catastrophes uh, will be performed sometime near, uh, some, sometime near, or is there a way to, to stream it? Yes, I think Marin Theater will um, have an archival, the, the beautifully filmed production will be available um, starting uh, sometime next year. So I'll try to, to, to let y'all know about it, but they will um, be, it'll be available just to stream um, at any time. So hopefully we'll see it, see it soon. There is a couple of other productions coming up, but not in the, in California. Nice. All right. Excellent. And um, actually, I think there was another question about uh, uh, any of your other plays besides the one currently running at Marin Theater that are scheduled for production in in the Bay Area over the next year or so. Yeah. So in Sacramento, um, there is the first of the the Christmas plays, uh, Miss Bennett. And then there's one, I think, in some other part of uh, San Francisco that's doing the Wickhams, um, which is the second one. So you could you could theoretically see all three. Yes. In Runner Park. Right. Um, (laughs) You could you could three if you have a have a car and some gas money, you can. Um, (laughs) And then let's see next year. What is happening next year in the Bay Area? Yes, there will be some. I can't remember them. There's one in Arizona, a short flight away. There's a new musical called Justice, which is about Sandra Day O'Connor, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and a um, a fictional 
future justice that we meet the three of these women in an amazing new musical with um, by Brie Loudon Rook and Kate Kerrigan doing the music. So that'll be really fun. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm not sure all of the all of the stuff happening in the Bay Area, but but yes, next year will be quite busy. <laughs> And I've, I've noticed your website seems to be pretty up to date with all of the different projects you're working on. I, I try to be. <laughs> <laughs> we should keep tuning into your website. Sometimes it's a full-time job to update that website. <laughs> <laughs> would you ever do um, a play? Uh, we, we talked about Stacey Abrams. She seems like she would be somebody who would be interesting to think about. Uh, I would know. certainly support that play. I probably would not be the right person to write it, but I will. Yeah, yes, someone write it, please. Oh, my God. <laughs> Stacey Abrams. <laughs> So a question from our audience, has the pandemic affected your writing process in any way? Um, how's it, how has it evolved over time? Oh man. You know, the funny thing about the pandemic was I'm used to being at home writing all the time anyway. So being forced to be home, the only problem was what I was with my family. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm used to being at home. The home wasn't the problem. It was everyone else at home. That was <laughs> so I'm certainly grateful for school. Thank God for teachers. We should give them all of the money that, you know, Elon Musk has. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> so, yeah, so that part, it, it was mainly like just being so grateful to have the time when I have it and um, to take advantage of it um, as I, as I have it. So that it didn't really change it, but I was certainly more grateful and, and um, tried to be as efficient as I can with, with the time. Drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like a lot of blurred lines happened during the pandemic. My goodness, indeed. So um, I don't know if you can see the chat. There's a lot of love for Silent Sky uh, in the chat. Oh, um, you. <laughs> I, I think people may be doing their own readings of it. Um, can you talk a little bit about that play and how that developed? Um, hold on. And folks, make sure you keep those questions coming. Um, we'll continue on for a few more minutes uh, with questions for Lauren Gunderson. And uh, hi there. <laughs> Sorry, all the animals decided to come in at once. Um, I was say, it, it, <laughs> as proof of your our, our last little snippet of conversation. <laughs> oh, gosh, yes, you gotta you gotta it do it again, right? <laughs> Hard, the hard but kind mommy voice of like, it's time to go now. Please, please go. <laughs> um, <laughs> the silent yes. sky. How did that come about? You know, that was one of my um, early-ish science plays. Um, and I it came about walking into a used bookstore and seeing this biography of, of Henrietta Leavitt and thinking, I thought I knew all the lady scientists. And of course, I mean, what a ridiculous thing to think. But I saw it and I thought, oh my gosh, I have to know about her. And what struck me about her that felt like it was ripe for a play was this, the particular science that she was doing was based in things that felt very much like music, the language of music. So rhythm and magnitude and um, the idea that you could convey some of her science. It was uh, uh, astronomy about a kind of blinking star called a Cepheid variable, which blinks at a, a, a constant rate. And that again felt musical. So how can we maybe bring in some of the music? Well, okay, maybe her sister is a musician. Great, okay, so her sister is a musician. So we have access to music in the play and she's the scientist and they realize they're both kind of using the same language. And so it, it just felt kind of from there, um, uh, a play that I could, I could use to write about stuff that I love, which again, ladies, sisterhood, both inherited and chosen science and trying to make science really beautiful and memorable as well um, as a, you know, the small public service of kind of like, go science. <laughs> Definitely appreciate that. I've uh, studied Sifia variables actually early on. So I'm always amazed when Did you no way. Of, of Henrietta Leavitt. She's How cool. Right. I, I worked totally at the a crater on the moon named after her. So, right. <laughs> and I wish more people knew her story. So thank you for bringing your story to so many people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm just checking the chat to see if there are any other questions that we missed. Um, but while, uh, while we're sort of getting to the last questions, I, I wanted to ask you, maybe it's a loaded question, uh, but will there be any more installments um, in the Pemberley series? Like, would we find out if Mr. and Mrs. Collins moved into Longbourn House or maybe <laughs> Kenderberg left society behind and became a, a naturalist or a scientist? Or <laughs> I love it. I love where you're going. Um, I think Margo and I have decided that that's like three is the right amount. It's a nice, solid, stable amount. 
But, you know, Jane Austen herself is so interesting um, that my we've discussed, uh, you know, perhaps it's not Pride and Prejudice, but maybe Jane um, or maybe someone else of that time. Uh, so I'm, I'm certainly I, I love the um, the community that's that's been created out of those plays. So it's very hard to say no. So maybe talk to us in a couple of years. We'll get we'll miss them so much. We'll start writing more. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, I just want to thank you all for uh, for joining us this evening. Um, thanks to the Friends of the Alameda Free Library for organizing this event. Um, I also want to remind everyone that the Friends do so much to advocate for the wonderful work of the City of Alameda's library. So please do consider supporting them uh, with a donation. You can go to alamedafriends.org to find out how to give. And of course, my deepest gratitude to you, Lauren, for spending the time with us tonight. Thank you so um, much. Great questions. <laughs> Thank you. And it's lovely to get to chat with you. Um, once again, you can see Georgiana Kitty and Kitty, both of them, <laughs> on Christmas or Beverly, um, I believe through December 19th at Moran Theater Company. Is that right? right? And you can also stream it. I think it'll stream for a little bit longer than that if you if you aren't sick of the streaming theater, which it's a it's beautiful streamed production. It, perfect for a lovely little cozy Christmas night, right? <laughs> And I also want to recommend uh, your book, Dr. Wonderful and Her Dog, Blast Off to the Moon. That's a, a good gift for any young readers <laughs> that are on the holiday. Indeed. Yeah, yes, indeed. Thank you so much. What a, what a delight to be in all of your company. And thank you for the questions. And thank you for all that this great organization does um, for literary fans and authors. And uh, yeah, those who really care to think. So thank you. All right. Thanks again. And uh, lovely to meet your, your pets and, uh, and also to get to a little Pikachu. So <laughs> thank you, everybody. All right. I'm going to toss it back to you, Karen. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mary Ellen. And thanks to Lauren for a fantastic, fascinating discussion about playwriting and the various aspects uh, in writing a play. I was so pleased to see um, her, the ability to pull in um, the sciences and politics, which are other uh, passions of mine. So uh, I'm hoping that we'll all have an opportunity to see some of these plays either uh, virtually or in person. And um, we are so pleased that both of you joined us for this discussion. And we do hope that local theaters will, ch will choose to produce more of your productions. And I also want to thank our superb moderator, Mar Mary Ellen Hutt, who also has many fans among our viewers. It was just a fantastic uh, discussion tonight. This was an exceptional program and we're so fortunate that they chose to spend time with us tonight. And now moving on to 2022, we have more fascinating Friends at Home programs. On January 19th at 7 p.m., join us to hear from author and investigative reporter, Larissa Zomberoff. Larissa will talk about her book, Technically Food, Inside Silicon Valley's Mission to Change What We Eat. And she describes a paradigm shift transforming the food we eat and the companies behind it. On February 7th, we honor Black History Month with a program about Jacob Lawrence, one of the greatest African-American artists. The docent will discuss a 60 panel set of narrative paintings depicting the Great Migration where hundreds of thousands of African-Americans moved from the rural South to the urban North after World War I. And I encourage you to read Isabel Wilkerson's superb book on the Great Migration, The Warmth of Other Suns. And please consider a donation to Friends of the Alameda Free Library at alamedafriends.com or check the chat for a link. Watch our website, newsletter, and Facebook page for additional events and to register. And a special recognition to our fantastic production team, David Beale, Karen Romer, Karen Manuel, Becky Sear, Kelly Ground, and Billy Reinschmidt. Finally, thanks to you, our audience, for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you in 2022. Good night. <laughs>